And now look at the latest technological trends in tomorrow's world. This is the first ever one-man skydiving kit. And to make it work, the effect in there would need to be exactly the same as the effect you'd get if you plummeted down from 10,000 feet. In other words, you'd need a tremendously powerful airflow coming up at you. And this is where it comes from. There are three of these 50 horsepower motors, each of them driving a fan. And the air from the fan is driven down a cylinder, which curves upwards into the central column. The ground airflow is now being forced to a proportionally smaller area. That has the effect of accelerating it to something like 70 miles an hour. Enough to make you fly. Yes, fine. Very clever. But what's to stop you flying right out the top? Well, the design prevents that from happening because the column widens out at the top. That diffuses the air and reduces its speed. So when you get that high, the air isn't moving fast enough to support you. And you sink down to fly again. I could have spread my wings and done a thousand things I've never done before. I'll never know what made it so exciting? Why all at once my heart took flight? No, I can't talk to you at the moment. But yeah, I promise I'll phone you in a few minutes. Of course, everybody knows about radio telephones. They go with shiny cars and are used by playboys. There's a big problem, though. They're so scarce, especially in big cities, that you often have to be able to afford the shiny car to get the phone. So why are they so scarce? Well, look at London. In the current system, there's the post office tower and three other transmitters like this sending out and receiving from radio signals from the radio bandwidth dedicated to them at about 160 megahertz. So, provided you're somewhere in here, you can pick up signals from one of those four transmitters. But there's a limit to the number of subscribers the system can handle. For a start, there just isn't enough bandwidth available to provide each transmitter with more than 23 channels. And that means there are only 92 routes for radio phone calls in the whole of the London area at any one time. And to prevent the system being continually clogged up, they have to limit the service to only 4,000 subscribers. A new system about to be announced increases that 4,000 by a factor of six, but without using any more radio bandwidth. The plan is to divide London up into, say, 24 separate areas, each with its own transmitter. But these transmitters will operate at a much higher frequency, 900 megahertz. Now increasing that frequency does two things. Firstly, it has a much smaller range, 
And secondly, the signal can be contained more easily within the area of the transmitter. So, for example, this blue area here can operate its 23 channels without interfering with calls on the red area down here, or even the orange or the green areas, which are all operating on slightly different frequencies. But there's a clever bonus to this system. Because the blue signal is contained within its area, and it's surrounded by transmitters on different wavelengths, there's a distance between this and another blue area over here. And so another 23 channels can be operated in this blue area, and in this one here, and here, and here. And the same applies to the other coloured areas. So you can build up a sort of patchwork pattern of transmitters using only those same four wave bands. Ah, you say, but what happens when I'm on the telephone, travelling from Blue Westminster towards Red Lambeth? When I get cut off here? Well, the answer's no, because as soon as I start using the phone, my nearest base station, Blue, will work out which way I'm moving, so when I reach the boundary of the red area, I'm automatically switched over to the red transmitter on a different frequency. And it all happens so fast that my call won't even be interrupted. This system should immediately increase the number of subscribers from 4,000 to 24,000. At the moment, this whole briefcase of equipment is about as close as you can get to a portable telephone. But there's yet another advantage to the new cellular system. Smaller high-frequency transmitters means that you can have smaller telephones. And this latest one is completely self-contained within here. So let's try it out by uh, ringing the states from right here in the middle of the studio. In fact, I'm simply recalling a number which we've pre-programmed into its memory. But this is not like an ordinary cordless phone, which you can only use within a limited range of your own fixed phone. This one will become my personal phone, which I can take with me wherever I go. So I won't need to leave one number for my office and another for my home. And eventually I should be able to dial anywhere in the world. At the moment I'm trying to get through for a meaningful monologue to a certain lady in New York. So, uh, fingers crossed. And let's see if we can get through. It's ringing. I hope she's in. Good afternoon. At the tone, the time will be 2, 7. That's and right. 40 seconds. There we are. The speaking clock running precisely at five hours behind us. They never could get it right. And with this little phone, who needs the big flashy car? I can keep in touch, but simply on this little thing. But I do see one big drawback, because as long as there's a transmitter nearby, if I'm dropping in on the pyramids or popping up Everest, There'll now be no excuse for my not phoning that someone somewhere who's waiting for a call from me. Ah. Uh. Hello? Oh, <laughs> yes. I was Two just about to phone you. Inquiries into the disappearance of a suitcase containing potentially dangerous drugs from a car in Blackburn last night. The suitcase disappeared from a car on Northgate between 5 past 9 and 10 to 10. A police spokesman said the two men were in hospital, but they hope to interview them later today. After nearly seven hours of talks with the board... The Euro MP for Lancashire. Send one pump to Brigade Training Centre Fireground, Exton Lane Chorley, Nature Oil Drums. This is a first strike appliance from Lancashire County Fire Brigade. Four First to reach the scene of a fire, it's packed full of equipment to tackle every kind of emergency, from smoke-filled houses to forest fires. If it's a petroleum fire, as on this exercise, They've got foam. Concentrate is added to the water and mixed with large amounts of air. The foam then floats on top of the burning fuel. A major problem, however, 
is that making foam uses up large amounts of precious concentrate. And while it's very effective, if the fire isn't out in just two minutes, they run out. So at Lancashire, they're experimenting with what is quite literally an alternative solution. This is the very latest in fluoroprotein concentrates. Dissolved in water, it could be used to make ordinary foam. But it's also got another, much more interesting property. Here's a dish of inflammable cyclohexane. Even a small amount of the solution will extinguish the fire. And it does this by forming a thin film across the surface of the fuel. The breakthrough in Lancashire has been to find an effective way of generating this film. The answer? Atomize it, like perfume. All Lancashire's appliances were already fitted with high-pressure spray equipment. Premix the concentrate in the water tanks, and this should be a very effective way of producing that crucial film. To test it out, they're covering this concrete pitch in kerosene. To add to their difficulties, the fire will be fed throughout by this pipe. In a matter of seconds, the surface of the concrete will become so hot that it will start to explode. By any standards, a fire like this is a major incident. The whole fire is out in under 30 seconds. It's much quicker than foam, but more importantly, it only needed just six gallons of water. And there's still enough mix left in the engine's tanks to keep going, if needs be, for another 11 minutes. And that means that once fitted with this system, a first strike appliance can now tackle single-handedly the kind of petroleum fire that in the past would have meant a major call-out. Every day, we in Britain consume 16,000 aspirins for our various aches and pains. But oddly enough, it was only 10 years ago that the reason why aspirins worked was discovered. And it was that discovery, coupled with the work he's done since, that has won Dr John Vane this year's Nobel Prize for Medicine, which he collects with two colleagues in Stockholm tomorrow. Put simply, Dr Vane found that aspirins work because they stop the production of a group of substances called prostaglandins. Watch what happens when we hurt ourselves. <laughs> Moments later, the injured cells inside the body start to respond. Every living cell has a certain chemical trapped in its outer skin. And when the membrane is damaged, that substance is released. Now, what's in the cell, enzymes convert it into two vital active compounds. 
One type consists of the prostaglandins, and these move out of the cell and cause local blood vessels to expand. So the wound becomes inflamed and blood also leaks out and the area swells. And local nerve endings too are sensitized. So the slightest touch on an injured area causes pain. If the pain is bad enough, we take an aspirin. An aspirin acts by preventing the formation of the prostaglandins, thus relieving all the symptoms. But aspirins don't stop the production of the second group of substances, the leukotrienes. Now they also move out of the cell and attract the body's white blood cells, which migrate out of the vessels into the injured tissue. White blood cells normally devour bacteria, but in many cases, injured tissue isn't infected, and the white blood cells, with no bacteria to attack, turn on the body. OK, a blow on the thumb isn't that serious, but if you take a more chronic inflammation, and arthritis is a classic example, the effects can be very unpleasant indeed. This is a normal knee joint with a good gap between the bones. But this one on the right, with its eroded tissue, is arthritic. Aspirin, often prescribed for arthritis, will relieve the inflammation and help the pain, both caused by prostaglandins. But because it doesn't stop the leukotrienes, it can't stop this progressive joint deterioration. To solve this problem then, Dr. Vane and his colleagues have produced this. It's a prototype of a new drug, and it acts at source by preventing the production of both the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes. Now, we're not saying that this will cure arthritis any more than we're saying white cells are the sole cause of it. And a word of warning, even if this new drug lives up to Dr. Vane's high hopes and passes all the stringent government tests, it'll still be several years before it appears on the market. And now, before our next report, we should tell you that it contains scenes from an operation, which we know some viewers find distressing. Take a deep breath. do you breathe? Probably 13 to 15 times a minute is about right if you are sitting quietly and watching this program at the moment. And that may go up to about 30 times a minute if you were out jogging. But here in the operating theatres of the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast, the patients are regularly breathing at the rate of anything up to 400 times a minute. It's not an endurance test, but part of an assessment of a new anaesthetic technique. William Hart first started smoking when he was 12, and now it's finally caught up with him. There's a cancer in his right lung. Thank you. To make it possible for the surgeon to operate, as soon as the anaesthetic takes effect, Mr. Hart is given a dose of a drug that temporarily paralyzes all his well, body very muscles. Good. You're doing very well indeed. We'll see you soon. This also means that his natural breathing reflexes can't work. And so, as happens in most operations, Mr. Hart is artificially ventilated. In normal breathing, air is sucked down the windpipe and into the lungs, where it comes into contact with the very surface of the lung itself. It's there that oxygen is extracted from the air and the body's waste gas, carbon dioxide, is released and then breathed out. During an operation, machines take over this natural cycle. A tube in the patient's airway allows the anaesthetic gases to be driven in and out at about the same rate as would occur in natural breathing. But using conventional ventilation presents the surgeon with a major problem. These are the lobes of the right lung. Forced ventilation means that they're large and distended, rhythmically expanding in time with the machine. This continuous movement makes it hard for the surgeon to locate the cancerous areas and very tricky for him to operate on them. So in Belfast, they're trying out a new technique. 
It's called high frequency jet ventilation. Jet ventilation because this new machine delivers short, low volume bursts of oxygen. They're jetted down this small plastic tube and straight into the patient's lungs. And high frequency, because instead of operating at around 20 breaths per minute, which is what it's working at now, this machine is routinely working at around 400 breaths a minute. Halfway through the operation, the anaesthetist switches over to jet ventilation and the lung adopts a very different shape. Instead of rhythmically inflating and deflating, the lung just quivers gently. So it can be fully working and yet in a semi-collapsed state. And that means it's much easier for the surgeon to operate on. Much to their surprise, anaesthetists also found that jetting gave remarkably good control of the blood gas levels. The oxygen levels were very good, and the amount of potentially toxic carbon dioxide waste in the blood can be kept much lower than with conventional techniques. In Mr. Hart's case, the operation has gone very smoothly and jet ventilation has meant that the surgeon has been able to get at all the cancerous sections of the lung. The question that anaesthetists are now asking themselves is how far will jet ventilation replace conventional machines in other operations? Will it be useful in intensive care units and even perhaps in ambulances? And if that's so, well, maybe this new device, packed full of invisible microchips and solenoids, could spell the beginning of the end for one of those very special symbols of the operating theatre, the anaesthetist's black rubber bag. <coughs> well, it's OK for France. But I wouldn't hold out too much hope for me if they ran a contest to find Europe's strongest woman. This barrel weighs considerably more than I do, so if I'm ever to prove my own strength, I'm going to need a little bit of help. And here it is. It's a lever specially designed to lift oil drums. All I've got to do is to wheel it in, clamp it on, and we're ready to go. Now, because the distance from this handle down to the pivot is eight times the distance from the pivot to this bar here, which supports the weight of the drum, I can apply eight times the force. And there's even a device which will record the weight I'm trying to lift. So let's give it a go. Right. Now, in case you think I'm making rather a meal of this, it's because I don't happen to be a particularly tall person. So. Let's see how I've got on. Now, if you look at the figure here, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to see this at home. It's not terribly clear, but it's 239 kilos. Now, that is five times my own weight. Not bad for puny old me. So, maybe with the help of this, I wouldn't be uh, completely out of my depth in half an hour's time when some of the world's beefiest blokes compete for the title of the world's strongest man. Good night. And uh, British hopes will be pinned on Jeff Capes on BBC One in 40 minutes when Magic Mountain near Los Angeles is the scene for that contest to find the world's strongest man. First here's Simon Bates with Top of the Pops.